um, because I'm not sh sure everybody is here. So Megan I, building light has joined. Great. Hello, Phil. Hi. Perfect, Hi there, Megan. perfect timing. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and, and get started. Um, how, good morning, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Megan Wilden, and it's my honor and pleasure to be the executive director of OLLI, the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute at Berkshire Community College. Um, and we're here today to introduce you to some of our amazing volunteer instructors who will be teaching classes uh, for OLLI this fall in our fall semester. And that semester begins the week of September 20th. So you still have a couple of weeks to check your calendars and decide which classes to take. But I think after listening today to our amazing instructors, you'll probably want to take everything and then have to figure out how exactly to do that. Um, this semester, we are offering both online and in-person classes. Um, the in-person classes, everyone who registers for an in-person class is required to affirm that they are fully vaccinated. And when we um, when we surveyed our members recently, we found that the, the vaccination rate among our members, um, which I was not surprised at, was over 99%. In fact, no one said they were not vaccinated. Two people said they prefer not to say that. Otherwise, we would have a 100% rate. Um, so I think we probably are in the running for one of the most vaccinated groups in, this, in the country for the world. Um, so that is always um, nice to know. If, um, if something happens to make us to raise the concerns about in-person classes, we will move them to Zoom wherever we can. Uh, right now we are seeing people are registering, people are really looking forward to getting together um, and we are taking uh, all of the precautions that are suggested by the state and by the CDC. So, um, and I just want to uh, give a big shout out to our amazing staff. Uh, Ray Langsdale and Andy Ottoson have been uh, absolutely extraordinary over the past year and a half and beyond. And uh, even as we offered really, I think about twice as many classes and events as we normally do um, in these, uh, these uh, past year and a half. Um, and we also want to thank our amazing curriculum committees who work with our instructors and lure them in to teach classes. And many of our instructors are also on curriculum committees. And those are uh, committee focusing on the arts, on literature, on science, and on social science. And they um, all always welcome new members. So if you're interested in helping to develop classes, uh, they would be delighted to hear from you. So we have a great lineup of instructors to hear from. So I wanna get started. So we have time to hear from everybody. And um, this, I think I'm going to start with Ann Berman. Um, wait, no, let's, let me look at my list again. Oh, sorry, Phil McKnight and then Ann Berman. <laughs> based on um, who's here. And uh, Phil will be te teaching, whoops, it's Shakespeare and the Law, not Shakespeare and the Opera. Um, uh, that will be on Wednesday mornings in person at Williams College's uh, Venerable and Delightful Faculty Club. And Phil is a, uh, a lawyer. He is also, uh, I believe, an actor and singer. Is that right? Yes. Yep. So you know he's going to be entertaining, um, and he's a professor. He teaches at both Williams College and, and MCLA. So Phil, tell us about your course. Thank you, Megan, and thank you for letting me start off. Uh, hello, everybody out there in Zoom land. I'm delighted that uh, my course will not be on Zoom. Uh, in person, I think, is the only way to do uh, education. So what's going to happen is that on September 22 and for the next five Wednesdays in a row, September 29, October um, 6, October 13, and October 20, I'll be providing uh, lectures on Shakespeare and the law. This series is the middle of the three series uh, lecture series that I provide, Ollie, and I'm delighted that it turns out to be Shakespeare's turn. I have reserved a uh, sixth Wednesday at the end of October, but do not plan to use it. I have it because Occasionally, one of my colleagues needs a Wednesday for a visiting professor who can only come on that particular date. But it will be the first five from September 22 through 
October 20. The idea of the course is to provide you with a ba the background of Shakespeare from his birth to his death, uh, all the things we don't know about him, then to take a look at the period of time in which he lived and the influence of the earlier uh, kings, Henry VIII on, on Shakespeare and his family. And then as the end of that first lecture, I will give a brief outline of the development of the English common law from the Middle Ages through his day. And the idea is that this lecture series will take a look at the trial scenes in four of his plays, Winter's Tale, Measure for Measure, uh, Julius Caesar and the Merchant of Venice. And then after those uh, film clips have been provided, I, as a, an experienced trial attorney, will do a critique as to how Shakespeare handled the law in those scenes. You will get a course packet at the first meeting. And in that, I will provide you the uh, actual um, scenes of those plays. So you can follow along when you see the film. And then finally, in the last uh, of the series, at the uh, third week of October, I will delve into the always interesting subject of the authorship question. Was William of Stratford the man who actually wrote the plays, or was it William of the theater in London? Were they one and the same or two different people? Or if, as alleged by the pretenders to the crown, uh, he had nothing to do with the plays, somebody else wrote them. So we'll have a little fun with that because at the end of the last session, I will reveal to you what the computer has discovered, the actual person who wrote Shakespeare's play. And it took a computer to do so. Very fitting mm -hmm. in this modern age that we live in. So that's a quick outline of what I'm gonna be doing. Normally you would then be able to go upstairs and have lunch at the faculty club, but the club is on a restricted basis this uh, semester uh, and it won't be providing lunch on Wednesdays. But if you decide to take Jock Brooks and Tom Krenz's class at the Clark Art Institute at 1.30, which will be fascinating, you can have lunch at the cafeteria at the Clark right after finishing mine. Thank you, Megan, that's a quick outline. Thank you, Phil, that sounds amazing. And yes, um, unfortunately, uh, Jock Brooks and Tom Krenz who are teaching the Artistic Visionaries class Wednesday afternoons are were not able to join us today, but it makes for a great pairing of, of two wonderful classes uh, in Williamstown, so if you're, in the region, you can have a you know a, day, a visit there each week um, and and really have a wonderful time learning. Um, so next up, I'd like to introduce Anne Berman. Uh, she is te teaching a class on Edward the Second, and um, is very generous with her time um, and talent. She is teaching two sections of the class, the first um, in person at the BCC campus and the second online on Zoom. And Anne has a master's in Shakespeare. I can't find your, your, your bio right now, but um, I remember most of it and uh, was a frequent instructor at another lifelong learning organization. Was it Holy Cross? At Lark at Regis College at Regis College, um, but recently moved to the Berkshires and we are so much the better for it. So please join me in welcoming Anne. Well, thank you, Megan. And kudos to you also for keeping all of this up and running through an, an amazingly challenging time. I really appreciate it. Um, Megan said I was generous with my time. I'm actually selfish with my time um, because teaching and doing uh, research to get ready to teach is something I really enjoy. And uh, given the COVID situation, I wanted to make sure uh, for me that I had the opportunity to teach in person, but for people who might be interested and don't want to or can't be in Pittsfield every week, I'm happy to do uh, a course online. I've gotten over my fear of, of uh, Zooming. <laughs> so uh, I'll be doing Christopher Marlowe's Edward II. So in, again, in two different formats, uh, in person and also online, uh, whatever makes you more comfortable. And what we'll be doing is looking at Christopher Marlowe's play. Uh, we'll be looking at the 14th century context. That's when Edward II lived. And we'll learn about him, his life, some English history from that period, what sources Marlowe used. We'll also be looking at the 16th century when Marlowe was writing the play, what was going on in the theater and in London at that time, politically at that time. And we'll also be looking at Christopher Marlowe's life just as we'll look at 
uh, Edward II's real life and how it got transformed into a play. We'll look at publication and performance history. We'll look at some 20th century criticism and uh, performance. And um, it looks like David Gammons, who's a well-known Boston director who did a version of Edward II uh, about five years ago for the Actor Shakespeare Project, will be able to participate. Um, he also teaches on Thursday morning, so I'm not sure how we're gonna do it, but we'll figure out a way to, uh, to at least get him on a Zoom uh, to answer your questions about how he put his production of the play together. Um, especially in person, but also on Zoom, um, I love to have people read aloud. So I hope that if people are interested in doing some reading aloud from the text, um, that they'll join us and participate. And also wanted you to know, it's a tough text to get a hold of. So Ray has a copy uh, that I have given her that I'm not sure if it's on the website yet for the course, but it will be. And so that everybody can use the same text. It's about 30 um, printed pages. So you can use it on your computer or you can download it if you wanna be able to have a copy to look at. Um, but we'll all have access to the same text to work from as we work, work through the play. And um, that's it. Wonderful. Thank you, Anne. And those classes are on Thursday mornings. Yep. Uh, the yep. Live one is uh, first and the Zoom one is second. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And um, next up, I'd like to introduce Robert James. He is... Um, uh, a former, also a lawyer, and uh, worked for many years for the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey, and was past president of the New York Transformation Research Forum. A couple of years ago, he offered a class for Ollie on um, on on freight and how how your goods get to you. And I thought that's a, I think that's an interesting subject. I'm really not sure how many people are going to sign up for this. Well. Uh, over 40 people signed up for it and loved it because it's really fascinating to learn, you know, how the modern world works and how things come to you and stuff like that. Well, everything, if you took that class, I'm guessing everything you learned there has been turned a little upside down now um, by COVID. And uh, Bob is going to be talking about how, what those changes are. And he's going to have a lot of interesting uh, special guests. Sorry if I'm giving away too much. Um, but I also want to note that his class is scheduled for Fridays, at uh, in the morning at 1030 a.m. And it has been moved from in-person to online, actually not because of COVID, but for another reason. So please join me in welcoming Robert James. Thank you. Uh, I feel an instant affinity with my uh, previous, uh, the previous uh, course presenters. Uh, first of all, my wife's maiden name is Shakespeare. <laughs> and uh, she is a graduate of Regis College. So I suppose your timing of the program <laughs> couldn't be better because we have an instant uh, connection. As you might see by the title of the course, I was a little afeard, we'll use an old English word at this point, uh, that there may not be a lot of interest in something as dull as the old supply chain and moving uh, goods from here to there. But as it turns out, it, I think it's turned out to be a pretty exciting topic for all of us. Uh, certainly we all endured the uh, paper uh, shortage that we had earlier, including toilet paper, which may have had some of us very worried. And uh, so we've seen things like rising lumber prices. Uh, if you went out to get a new car, you might've noticed that there's not so many on the market because the micro chips aren't available. And this has a lot to do with uh, with transportation supply and demand, and particularly the way that COVID has hit transportation by interfering with the normal processes of both uh, supplies and demand. Currently, transportation markets and services are, in a simple word, fruit loops. Uh, we're in a crazy period, but it's a crazy period that is, is made, has shown us some of the weakness of the system through COVID shortages but it's also uh, indicates that there are endemic problems in the transportation systems, changes in technologies taking place that are causing a very different future for all of us. If we were to look back a few years and think about uh, what it was like to get a parcel from Sears and Roebuck, we realized that e-commerce has unleashed a number of very different uh, changes to us over uh, this period. So unlike some of the other topics uh, we have on this agenda, this is something that I think everyone participates in because we're all consumers. 
And, and if some of you are waiting patiently for your goods to show up for three or four months, like I was when I bought a roll top desk that was ordered in January and delivered in June, you realize it does have an impact in your life. Also in looking at this issue, when I did a, a freight course uh, uh, two Januaries ago, the emphasis was on the transportation modes. But now I wanna step back and look at the supply chains. And, and there essentially are uh, the global supply chain, there's movement goods across the country, then there's the state and local, and, and it's particularly the last mile part of the supply chain. That's what I want to talk about. And I also want to emphasize some uh, major transportation companies that are particularly changing the way business is done. One of those will be uh, Maersk, which is a Danish uh, shipping uh, conglomerate that is uh, leading that uh, segment of the industry in, in changes and in for their sake, fortunately, profitability. And I think all of us are aware of the Amazon effect, changes that are taking place on, in the last mile. And uh, we may not have noticed it, but drones are, for example, the robots are now coming in to be part of the uh, delivery process. And we'll all look at that issue because that's a challenge, which I think is the biggest challenge in the future, is getting goods to the, uh, to the last mile. I. I Hope to use a lot of, and I'm assembling YouTube videos and inf infographics uh, to help facilitate the presentation. I'm rather disappointed that I didn't have the opportunity to do a, uh, to do a classroom or a hybrid performance because I would hope to get more participation. So I'm hoping that uh, uh, class participants, as consumers, will bring their knowledge and their gripes into the class so that it will fil facilitate discussion. I've already talked to, to one woman who couldn't deliver my roll top desk in time and was very frustrated as someone who's very concerned about uh, consumer relationships to how, uh, why this happened. Uh, I'm also trying to get a friend of mine who's a former transportation commissioner in two states to talk to us about public policy issues. Finally, the last thing I would stress is that uh, your dollar vote counts. In the future, the transportation system will be determined by what the consumer has to say, particularly the sneaky way that Amazon is establishing information on our preferences. So that's it and thank you uh, for the opportunity to give this presentation. Thank you so much, Bob. That sounds amazing. Um, and next up, um, I'm uh, very honored to introduce uh, Berkshire District Attorney Andrea Harrington. Um, Ollie is partnering with the District Attorney's Office for a course entitled Inside the District Attorney's Office, um, which is uh, people often say that as an elected official, it's one of the um, uh, positions that people know the least about and that often has the greatest impact. Um, and that class will be held on Zoom. Uh, DA Harrington was elected uh, three years ago um, and has made a lot of uh, changes since then that we'll be hearing about in the class in a little bit perhaps today. Uh, DA Harrington. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, thanks for having me. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Andrea Harrington. I'm the Berkshire District Attorney, and I'm really excited about offering this class. I got great buy-in from my team. Uh, so, you know, when I ran for DA and when I was elected in um, the fall of 2018, I did something that people, many people thought was impossible because I beat an incumbent uh, district attorney and I won a seat that really had just kind of been passed along from, you know, one guy to his protege to the next. And my election was really a mandate to use the district attorney's office. Um, okay, oh, and um, DA Harrington, can you hold just a sec? Ray or Andy, I need you to put the spotlight on DA Harrington, please. I've sent you messages and I haven't heard back, so I'm not sure what's going on. Sorry, we just want to make sure we can see you while you're talking. That's okay. Let me know when you're ready. I don't, I, and I don't have the capacity. Thank you so okay. much. Okay, you're, you're front and center now. Okay, Please great. Continue. Thank you. Thank you. So um, it was, my election was really a mandate to use the role of the district attorney to advance criminal justice reform here in Berkshire County. And my office has been a leader uh, nationally in how we approach gender-based violence and racial justice in the district attorney's office. 
And we've changed the culture here of law enforcement in Berkshire County really as a shift to putting our resources towards violent crime, serious crime, and getting people who, you know, are get involved in the system, not because they're dangerous or violent per se, but really because they have substance use disorder, um, challenges with mental illness, uh, crimes of poverty. So we've, you know, totally revamped the office. I have a completely new team in the district attorney's office that we have built over the last three years. And we're really implementing um, policies that reflect the values and the mission of the office. So I think what we're doing as prosecutors is something that is brand new and hasn't been done before. So this course is going to operate on uh, several different levels. It's going to explain to people really kind of the nuts and bolts of the criminal system and how a prosecutor's office operates from the time that a case is investigated through pretrial, trial, appeals, post-conviction. Um, we're going to also get into, you know, the, the policy considerations and the actual, you know, this is what what we do and this is why we do it and this is what inspires us. And you're going to hear from the people in my office who kind of take those big ideas and turn them into policies and put them into practice every day. So we're going to have a number of uh, people from the office participating. Um, the first week we plan for that to be inside the Berkshire District Attorney's Office and an overview of the court system. That will be myself and Deputy District Attorney Dahoney. And then we're going to have have a life cycle of a criminal case where we give us overview of the superior court and the appellate court and you're going to hear from the first assistant district attorney and our chief of our appellate unit and then we're going to have a session uh, that's led by our specialized units so our uh, child abuse unit our special victims unit and our multi multidisciplinary team and we're also going to talk about the domestic sexual violence task force that my office has launched. And that's going to be presented by the chiefs of the child abuse and SVU units. And we're going to have a session on victims rights and trauma informed practices and the roles of victim witness advocates in the criminal process. And that'll be presented by the chief of the office's uh, victim witness advocate program. And then we will have a session on young people and the criminal justice system, reform, diversion, and youthful behavior that will be presented by Brian House, who is our director of community outreach and also um, our diversion coordinator for juvenile court and deputy district attorney, Rich Tahoney, who is the supervisor of our juvenile court program. And then for the final session, you will hear from myself and from uh, Detective Lieutenant Ed Culver. He was the Detective Lieutenant from um, who ran the State Police Detective Unit in my office, who is just recently retired, but he is a veteran homicide detective. So we're going to, you know, take you through the steps of a major crime investigation. So I'm going to tell you, you know, what happens when I go to a crime scene um, and the crime scenes I go to our unintended deaths or homicides. So we'll walk you through and we'll walk you through some of the big picture goals of the office. I'm happy to take any questions if people have questions, but um, I, I'm excited about offering the class. And you know, we do find that a lot of people don't understand the role of the district attorney. And I think it's really critical um, to our, our justice system for people to understand what we do and why. Thank you. Thank you so much, DA Harrington. Um, will you be able to stick around? We're going to have questions after we um, have the uh, all the instructors talk. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Thank you. And 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 would you say that this course would be of interest to people who may not live in Berkshire County, but just to get a, give a sense of what their the DA's office may do in their communities? Oh yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And you know, criminal justice reform is a. Uh, uh, topic nationally, and I'm part of a group of national leaders of district attorneys that are using this role to advance criminal justice reform. So certainly these kinds of topics and principles transcend various jurisdictions. Great. Thank you so much. Um, next, um, I'm skipping around the order by request, and I'm um, happy to, very happy to introduce Hank Gold. Hank is a retired 
anesthesiologist, which is something that is radiologist. Radiologist, sorry. Oh my gosh, is that an insult that I called you an yeah. I don't even know the. I don't know I the don't, order I among. Sleep. <laughs> I don't know the pecking order among doctors. Sorry. Anyway, Hank's a wonderful person with a lot of wildlife in his backyard, and he takes marvelous pictures and videos of it. And he is also the host of our moderate discussion class, um, Science Conversations, which will be held uh, Friday afternoons um, online on Zoom at uh, 3 p.m. Eastern. Pink? Thanks a lot, Megan. Uh, yeah, I'm real impressed at the, the, the summaries uh, that uh, people are giving uh, for the classes that they're going to be presenting. I can't do that. The Science Conversations is based on what the New York Times prints in their Tuesday Science Times section. We discuss whatever uh, interests people, um, and, and uh, we have some pretty good discussions going. Um, and I'm always open to uh, other suggestions. Their topics aren't always uh, the, the most uh, stimulating. Uh, and, and I love to hear from people about things that you might like to, to discuss as well. We've uh, had this class in the past. We have really good conversations and discussions about things. And I'm really looking forward to uh, leading this again. Thank you, Megan. Sure, thank you. Yeah, it always sounds like a fascinating class. And um, now uh, Phil Dealey has just joined us, which is wonderful. He started teaching for Ollie during the pandemic, um, he and has taught these amazing classes that feature uh, special guests from literally around the world. Uh, so we're so happy to have him teaching again. Um, this, this semester, the course is on the French Revolution. Um, it's going to be held on Monday mornings online. And I would say you don't want to miss it, which is true for all of our classes, but class? definitely true for this one. She's teaching? No, no, she already did the description, but I can point her out to you on a screen. Oh, and uh, Bob James, can you mute yourself? Certainly. <laughs> all right. It's all yours, Phil. Oh, okay. Am, am I coming through loud and clear? Absolutely. Excellent. Um, this uh, course is going to be uh, actually uh, quite different uh, than than what I've done in the past. Uh, I was uh, doing some uh, having some conversation with uh, a, a number of people about um, a particular interest that I have in the topic of, of revolutions and and uh, certainly could see that in the future as possibly being being a course. But this time, what we're going to do is take a deep dive uh, into the world of the French Revolution, because uh, for so many people, when you talk about revolution, the French Revolution is is front and center. Uh, for lots of reasons. Uh, this is going to be a four session course. Uh, so it, it will meet uh, every other Monday uh, during, during the period. And, and uh, we're gonna start out uh, talking about uh, themes and events of the 18th century uh, that I think will be uh, familiar uh, to, to a lot of people having to do with uh, the character of the Ancien Regime, uh, the, the economics, politics, and the various forces at work uh, in the 18th century. And then we're going to focus in on some things. Uh, Olivier Mesle, uh, uh, who is, uh, as you may guess, French, uh, but it is not uh, of the era of the French Revolution, but he's the director of the Clark Art Museum uh, in, uh, uh, in Williamstown. And Olivier uh, has uh, a particular specialty in, in uh, French and British art. And uh, he and I are going to be talking about uh, the, the art of the uh, 18th century uh, and uh, how it reflects. Uh, the events of the time. Um, I'm interested in it in the art from a political standpoint. In other words, uh, can it make you a revolutionary just to listen to, uh, to look at a piece of art uh, or to listen to uh, music of the period? Does the Marseillaise uh, 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 bring about uh, commitment to to revolution, and how does that how does that all work? 
next sessions, we'll look at the structure of France, the economics, the politics, but in particular to look at the French Revolution as a model for other revolutions. Uh, and uh, in, in the last session, um, uh, we're gonna, I, I've invited David Baum to come in uh, because he's very interested in his teaching a course at Simon's Rock in the French Revolution. And he and I had conversations after I moderated his session uh, for Ali and, and I asked him if he could give me a quid pro quo uh, and uh, talk uh, in a session about revolution as a model, uh, as an archetype, uh, and uh, to look at, at, at later revolutions. Uh, uh, the, um, uh, uh, you know, Russian Revolution, uh, the Cuban Revolution, uh, revolution in China and, and others, and, and to ask the question to what extent was the um, French Revolution a model. And finally, um, uh, Lionel uh, de Levine, who's been a participant in, in many of the courses and very active in, in Ali, uh, and, and, and he too is French, and he too uh, did not live during the French Revolution. Uh, he, ha he has, however, been a photographer of revolutions in France. Uh, and um, uh, as, as, as his name suggests, uh, and his manner, no, no, uh, no, I'm sure, uh, also uh, reveals, he's a man of the former aristocracy uh, and has, I think, views about the revolution uh, that may be at, at odds with his uh, social lineage. Uh, so uh, his his views and and an active look uh, in the world of revolution uh, in France uh, in uh, uh, 1968 uh, when the cobblestones were being ripped out of the Paris streets once more and, and revolution was in the air uh, that will be our topic. So lots going on in that course. Uh, I'm doing a lot of homework. I've put up a suggestion of a couple of books, uh, Simon Schumer's uh, Citizens uh, and um, the Oxford History of the French Revolution for anybody who, who'd like to uh, uh, refresh themselves, uh, but that's not necessary. So uh, it will be an interesting course, I think, uh, an active one, and, and one where even more than some of the others I've taught, I think audience participation will be uh, certainly invited, and, uh, and uh, I hope to see many of you online. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Bill. As you can see, all of these courses sound terrific. I want to remind our wonderful instructors that as a thank you gift from Ollie, you you yourself can sign up for any class you wish as a gift from us. So I'm sure you're listening closely in trying to decide when there's so many wonderful uh, courses to choose from. Um, now it's my uh, honor to uh, welcome Gordon Josephson. Gordon is currently vice president of the Ollie Board of Directors and chair of its governance committee. He's a retired emergency position, uh, physician and a former chief operating officer. Is it operating? officer, yes, of Bay State Medical Practices, where he oversaw 600 physicians and advanced practice clinicians. He also has a master's degree in public health and has done a lot of uh, wonderful updates for us on COVID and other issues. Um, and this fall, he is teaching a class um, on the history of the uh, uh, transformation of our life expectancy over the past 100 years. Um, and that class will be offered Tuesdays at 10.30 a.m. online. So please join me in welcoming Gordon Josephson. Uh, thank you so much, Megan. I appreciate the uh, kind introduction. So uh, for, for those of you that may have been lucky enough to have caught um, a series of PBS presentations uh, called Extra Life, um, A History of Living Longer. It was only, they showed it in four successive weeks, uh, maybe three months ago. And uh, I was absolutely mesmerized by this because we, it's sort of in, in uh, our thinking about our own personal health and um, how we've arrived at where we are now in our healthcare system and 
what goods and services are available to me. It was stunning to learn, and, and Megan alluded to this, that um, it's only been 150 years, roughly, since, so not 150, but 120 years, since our average lifespan was around 32 years. And now it's more than double that. And the question is, what the heck is behind that? How did that happen? We're the same, we're the same species, we're the same DNA. And uh, the explanation is really offered um, in the program and what I've taken and, and, and manipulated things a little bit. So you'll see some of the, the videos of this, but also some more detail and some more information behind four major um, ideas that are, that are generated. The first is, and it's very timely right now, is mass vaccinations, particularly in children. So uh, this um, has had a profound effect. The second and is the uh, evolution of medications and treatments. And it may come as a surprise to a lot of us that um, much before the middle of the 1900s, like where, with, where many of us are near being born, medical care was pretty, pretty um, um, non-scientifically based. It had a lot of uh, hocus pocus. And uh, so, so looking at that and taking a deep dive. The third leg of the stool is looking at data and information and what a difference it's made with our powerful computers and other things to really understand what's going on around us. And lastly, our last uh, topic will focus on the issue, surprisingly, of the impact of hygiene and cleanliness People were pretty piggy uh, b back in the day and how they left and how often, you know, you heard about the, the what is it, the Sunday bath or the Saturday bath, the once a week kind of uh, thing. Now it's pretty much a daily ritual and marrying that to public health and that whole science. So looking at this as a sum, we're going to take each of those things apart. I'm going to add uh, a few uh, highlights and additional thoughts on each of those and a lot of videos that we're going to look at. I would remind everyone that uh, there'll, there'll be an opening talk on the vaccines, I think on that first Monday, which is the September 21st, but then we won't resume again until October in three successive days in October, simply because of some uh, travel that I had long ago arranged to do. Anyway, I hope you, uh, if you're interested in participating in this course. I look forward to your involvement. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Gordon. That sounds really wonderful. And your background in public health is, is so invaluable these days um, and in this course. Um, I'm uh, switching around the uh, order again uh, by request uh, very briefly. And uh, next up, we I'd like to introduce Professor Fan Yang. Um, she is teaching a class on social media that will be held Thursdays at 11.30 a.m. in person at Berkshire Community College. Uh, she's a first-time instructor for Ollie, and we're delighted to welcome her. Hi. Uh, thank you, Megan, for uh, fitting me in. Uh, I saw, I'm sorry for the short notice. Um, I'm so delighted uh, to be able to teach for Ali. Uh, I'm uh, currently a assistant professor at University at Albany in the Department of Communication. So this coming fall, I'm going to offer a course on uh, enhancing technological inclusion, diversity, and digital justice. So since the pandemic, uh, we have become only increasingly dependent on a variety of communication technologies. Um, as a matter of fact, we are now relying on Zoom to communicate with each other for better or worse. Um, however, communication technologies, like many other uh, inventions in our daily life, has their built-in biases. And this is why now we as a society need to talk about important topics such as how to enhance inclusion and diversity in technological industry so that everybody, especially the marginalized 
and the vulnerable populations can start benefiting from these communicative technologies, such as social media and artificial intelligence. Um, in this semester, I'm very excited to offer a course about making communication technologies friendly and inclusive to everyone. Uh, this is an in-person uh, class on Thursday, 11.30 a.m. And throughout this course, we will talk about uh, the role of communication technologies in our life, our relationships and interactions with them. And we will also cover uh, hot topics such as algorithmic, algorithmic uh, discrimination, such as who is better off, who is worse off, who has been left out and who has been ignored in technological industry. And we will talk about digital and data justice. We will also cover uh, misinformation and disinformation, something we all worry about and concern about. Um, we will also talk about um, how and how to effectively take advantage of these technologies to benefit our own life. Um, this is going to be a very fun course, um, conversational based. Um, I'm really excited about it and wish that you can sign up for this course and give it a try. Uh, thank you so much and wish you all a great semester ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Yang. And that class is a limited registration. So it's, I think the limit is about 20 people. So if you do want to sign up, I encourage you to do that early. Um, that is going to be held in person at BCC and uh, mass will be required um, for that class. So thank you, Professor. Um, up next, we have Christine Casey. Christine is um, is another uh, new new uh, resident here in the Berkshires who has taught at other lifelong learning organizations in the past. So the first thing she did was reach out to us and we are so happy she did. She has a bachelor's and master's degree in music education from Northwestern University. Um, and uh, she, after she retired, um, from working in public schools, teaching music and being a choral director and much more. Uh, she worked as a volunteer at the Lyric Opera of Chicago and uh, led many classes and talks about opera. And that is the subject of her first class for Ali at BCC, which will be held on Mondays at 3.30 p.m. on uh, Eastern time online. So please join me in welcoming Christine Casey. Thank you, Megan, and, uh, and thank you, everyone. I'm really looking forward to participating in the Berkshire Ali program. Uh, and, and my offering is six, let's see, what did I call it? Six scenes and sounds of six great operas. I'm going to focus uh, each week on a different opera. I'll be doing, um, I don't know if this is the order, but I'll be doing Carmen, La Boheme, La Traviata, The Marriage of Figaro, Faust, and uh, I think uh, The Merry Widow as well. So it should be a lot of fun. And what I, what I hope to do in the lectures is really anybody that, that doesn't know much about opera, all the way to people that know a great deal about opera, I think we'll enjoy this. I'll talk a little bit about the composer, the librettists, how this composer came to write this uh, opera. Um, I'll talk about, uh, Maybe the the uh, the time the period of time that the opera was being presented the style of music that 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 changes as operas have progressed throughout time. I'll uh, show slides of uh, of major opera scenes in that opera, and I will have recorded excerpts of uh, of those major scenes. Um, after that, I hope to have some time to talk a little bit. At, from the perspective of a singer as to what the challenges might be. Uh, what, what, is, what is easy, what is difficult? What is the singer really going to have to focus on in each of these things? Um, I've, I've done a lot of uh, lecturing on operas in the Chicago area. I think I've done it for about 13 years and we moved here to the Berkshires and I was so glad to be able to connect with the Berkshire Alley. And I, I hope it's gonna be a lot of fun. I'm really looking forward to it. 
Thank you so much, Christine. We're, we're thrilled to have you here. Um, and next up, I have another uh, beloved uh, music instructor to introduce, and that is Ken Stark. Uh, Ken is uh, so active in the Berkshires community. He serves on multiple boards of directors. Um, everywhere you go, you see him supporting uh, the arts and supporting kids. It's a, it's a wonderful, wonderful thing. Um, he is a former professor at City College of New York and a school psychologist for the New York City Department of Education. But what he does here at Ollie is he teaches uh, really extraordinary classes on classical music. Um, and he prefers to teach in person. So we've been waiting and for the opportunity to present him in person again. His course will be held at Berkshire Museum um, on Fridays at 1 p.m. So please join me in welcoming Ken Stark. Thank you very much for those kind words. Um, I don't deserve it, but thank you just the same. During the time of Bach, Beethoven, and Brahms, there were literally hundreds of uh, composers uh, composing just fantastic works that some people would say were as equal to, if not better, than some of the other major works that some of the, the three Bs, Bach, Beethoven, and Brahms composed. Um, so what I am going to share with you is the music of contemporaries of those three at their respective times that you may never have heard of, but that you should. We'll talk about their biographies, their life, and listen to, oh, a bunch of the music that they, re that they have uh, composed. I hope to do about eight or 10 uh, of their contemporaries for each of them throughout the six sessions. But since there are literally hundreds of them that compose music, I sort of had to decide which ones I wanted to concentrate on. So I picked ones that, that either influenced Bach, Beethoven, or Brahms, or influenced by them. They maybe premiered some of their works. They had relationships with other very famous composers. They shared friends, they shared positions. So there was some connection with the ones that I'm gonna share with you to the three Bs. Um, not for nothing, but if you've ever um, shared these courses with me in the past, not that I like to bribe people, but I do bring a snack for everybody. The first, it's a thank you snack, the first class. Um, and uh, at the last class, I do give everybody a compact disc of some of the music that we've listened to or didn't have time to that they could take home and, and carry with them. I do want to thank Andy. Andy and I went to the museum yesterday and met with them. And um, you can be assured that with the certain parameters that Megan explained for the registration and the logistics of the auditorium at the museum is going to be a very, very safe environment. I don't have any hesitation about being there in person, and I hope you don't either. So thank you very much and hope to see you soon. Thank you so much, Ken. I'm so glad to hear that the visit yesterday was successful. Um, we just have three more instructors uh, to, um, that will be speaking and you don't wanna miss them because they're, they're fabulous, of course. And uh, the next one I'd like to introduce is Marty Weinstein. And also just wanna note that uh, we're happy to answer questions afterwards. You can put them in the chat, either for Ollie staff or for any of the instructors. Um, and we can address them then. Uh, so Marty Weinstein is a retired uh, professor of political science. He is the author of a number of books on Latin America um, and has advised Congress and spoken at hearings. And I think this is what really makes him um, a bona fide Latin American expert. He has been marked for assassination um, at, at a point in his life in South America. So he knows his stuff. He's a, a, a top Ollie instructor and we're very happy that he's going to give us the lay of the land uh, post-Trump, probably not post-COVID yet, but uh, please join me in welcoming uh, Professor Marty Weinstein. Thank you very much, Megan. Uh, yes, it, uh, the exclamation point and with a question mark became the issue in talking about post-COVID 
and post-Trump. And I concluded uh, at this point in time that it probably both deserve a question mark, not an exclamation point. It is, it's certainly not post-COVID anywhere and especially not in Latin America right now. And it's, it's post-Trump in a legal sense, but politically, I don't think I have to remind this audience, uh, there's a lot of hangover. Uh, we're now five months into the Biden administration. So it is, and especially with the events of, of the last two weeks, it's time to look at Biden policy toward Latin America and what that means both in a post-Trump question mark and a post-COVID environment for these countries and for the United States. Um, it's no secret to us here in the United States that COVID laid bare enormous amounts of things that have not been given proper attention to of issues of equality, public health, et cetera, et cetera. For Latin America, it laid them bare in spades. And uh, it's been horrendous in many countries in Latin America and a testament to democracy and rationality in a couple of countries in Latin America. And I'll be going into that. Um, in terms of what we're facing and what the world is facing right now, there's an ancient Chinese curse. May you live in interesting times. And boy, are we living in interesting times. And what I want to emph emphasize in terms of the connection between looking at the policy of an American administration and the internal dynamics and economic and political situations in a series of Latin American countries is that many of these issues that are faced by any American administration are issues which a good colleague of mine once dubbed intermestic. In other words, we like to think there's this huge division between domestic policy and international, you know, foreign affairs. That's absolutely not true. And it's certainly not true when it comes to the Americas. Um, Trump had a very hard line toward Cuba, just to give you a quick example. Trump had a very hard line toward Cuba, uh, thanks to Senator Marco Rubio, of course, and the whole right wing of, the hard right wing of the Republican party. Uh, surprise, surprise, Biden has not changed one iota of that policy toward Cuba. And you might say, well, that's interesting. He brought all of these people in from the Obama administration and that worked closely with him or, or had significant jobs under Obama. How come? Florida, Florida, Florida. The issue of Florida and its electoral votes hangs over every president and every head of political party going forward. Now, in this sense, and, I, and I'll stop there, uh, Cuba didn't help its own cause with its recent crackdown if the people went into the streets because of their own dire situation on the COVID and dire situation economically. Uh, uh, and yet there was yet another crackdown in Cuba. So it would be almost impossible for especially a democratic president to lighten up at this point in time. But there are other issues in regard to that. The same is true for Venezuela. Um, in, in Brazil, which is to us, probably the second most important country in Latin America after Mexico, uh, Brazil has a president who can only, can best be accurately described as the tropical Trump. <laughs> uh, and, and he's so mismanaged the situation that Brazil has had a horrendous number of cases, a horrendous number of deaths. Uh, so um, we'll talk about. There's, there, there will be a lot to talk about. There will be five sessions there on Mondays, uh, starting on the 20th of September. And 
I will certainly be talking about any country that someone wants to be interested in, but I will be emphasizing Cuba, Venezuela, Mexico, uh, Brazil, Argentina, Chile, Ur Uruguay, and I have a bit to say about Peru also. Wonderful. I'll stop there. And that, and uh, thank you so much, Professor Weinstein. And um, his class is on Mondays at 1.30 p.m. online. Um, it's 1.30 Eastern, so open to everyone and always, always a fascinating um, series of the ever-changing and sometimes not changing uh, world of foreign relations. Um, so just two left. Um, I am delighted now to welcome Vivian Dorsal. Vivian holds a Master of Fine Arts in writing from the Vermont College of Fine Arts and was editor and publisher of the Upstreet Literary Magazine for 17 years, uh, which won a number of awards. Uh, she teaches uh, for Ollie each year uh, and we're delighted to have her. She's teaching a class on memoir writing and um, the class will be held in person. It's Thursdays at 1.30 p.m. Uh, in Great Barrington and it's limited to just 18 um, students um, so that there's lots of opportunity for give and take. Uh, so thank you so much for being here today, Vivian. Thank you very much, Megan. Ali always makes me sound so smart. <laughs> you are. <laughs> My course, Writing Your Story, An Introduction to Memoir, is a generative workshop on writing the personal memoir for writers of all levels. It's conducted in six weekly 90-minute sessions. If you sign up for this workshop, I will ask you to read and discuss examples of short memoir pieces and then work on some memoir writing exercises in response to the writing prompts I'll give you. You may bring journals, letters, photographs, or other mementos that will help stimulate memories of the people, places, and events that have been important in your life. You should expect to spend some time on homework assignments between class meetings. I've conducted this workshop for Ollie six times before and variations of it in other venues such as the Norman Rockwell Museum, the Jewish Federation of the Berkshires, the Berkshire Athenaeum, and several other public libraries. Many of the people who have taken the class before tell me that they do it because they want to leave something behind for their children and grandchildren. But whatever your motive is for taking it, we'll try to help you work it out. Um, that's about all I have to say because I have less to say about this than the other instructors about my course because what's important in my class is not what I will present or what I have to say, but what the students will be doing which is writing. Thank you so much, Vivian. Um, so happy about uh, you um, offering your memoir class for us. Um, I get so is this the sixth one or the seventh one? This is the seventh one. Seventh one, all right, lucky number. Um, that's terrific. That's gonna be held in Great Barrington um, in person on Thursdays at, where did I write that? At 1.30 p.m. and um, Next up, I'd like to introduce our final um, instructor of the day, who also all of these instructors are, are so highly regarded by the OLLI members that have taken their classes uh, for very good reasons. I'd like to introduce Doug Robbins. He is sort of teaching a class that's a complementary to what you're doing in writing, Vivian, but his class is on creating a photo essay. Um, it's also in person. It's also in Great Barrington. It's also very limited, uh, just 12 people people maximum. Um, so there's a lot of uh, give and take in and personal um, assistance and so forth. Um, Doug is a uh, holds a bachelor's degree from the University of Pennsylvania at the Wharton School of Business. He's the founder of Xenon Media, a content provider for advertisers, worked with most major ad agencies in Fortune 500 hundred companies, but his love is photography. And uh, we've been so fortunate that he's been sharing his love um, here uh, with our OLLI members. So please join me in welcoming uh, Doug Robbins. Hi, Doug. Megan, thank you very much. It's a very flattering introduction, which I probably don't deserve, but I'll say thanks. I also want to throw out there something that Megan mentioned, 
not to make anybody sensitive here, but um, you had said that as the result of this class, you're entertaining taking a look at it and possibly publishing for oh, yeah. Ali students, which I think is a really cool idea. No one should feel under any pressure at all. Um, I want this to be a fun journey. This is as much a learning experience for me as I want it to be for the students. I want it to be small. I'm also very, very sensitive about COVID. Um, the reason we're not starting the first week in September is actually my, my wife and I are going to the Smokies and I plan to take a whole bunch of photographs while I'm down there. I will test myself upon return because we know that the Carolinas are a little bit different in their ideology about vaccines and COVID. And I'm extremely sensitive um, about making sure that everyone is safe in our class. I've taught online before. I think that in order to do this properly, we need to do this in person. And um, I haven't really figured out how we can do this as a Zoom class. What I, what I wanna teach <clears throat> is the process of telling a story with images. I want this to be fun, but I also want this to be a challenge. And the question that kind of comes up is that, are you an editor or a photographer? With, an, with the technology that we all have now, everyone shoots vast piles of images. And it's kind of like, well, let's capture everything that we can with a machine gun and edit later. And really what I wanna to try to talk about is, Let's design a cohesive story. Let's figure out how to look at things differently, how to photograph with purpose, and how to take better images which will cohesively connect to the development of the story. Also, we'll talk about um, uh, workflow, how to organize images, other platforms where we can present and publish images. You know, there are, there are a number of, of uh, programs and opportunities now and, and I've been doing this now for a while. It's a lot of fun because we shoot digital images. It lives on a drive somewhere. It's not in an envelope where we can show friends and family. We'll look at, look at these pictures. And um, I think that this will be um, a challenge for every student. I want it to be, I want it to be fun. I want us to learn from both our successes and our failures. And this is really to be a collaborative journey where we can all share. I don't wanna be the only person kind of teaching in the room. I want all of us to share collaboratively. Um, I would prefer if students had manually controllable cameras, but it's not a necessity. Um, this is open for every level of photographer. You can capture stories with an iPhone. I personally don't like working in that format, but I accept the dynamic of it and how powerful an instrument it's been through our photographic journey. Um, Megan, that's about it. That sounds amazing. One of the hardest things about being the director of OLLI is I don't get to take these classes and I wanna take every single one. So a big thank you to all of our instructors who have joined us here today. Thank you uh, to Arlene Breskin. Thank you to everyone that's here and listening and enjoying. I encourage you to register for classes. You can do it online um, or by calling the OLLI office, which, which is, uh, who knows where the number will ring because sometimes we're working at home. We're starting to work a little bit in the office again. Um, and that number is 413-236-2190. I also wanna remind people who are not members yet, uh, you do need to join Ollie in order to become, in order to take classes. And we want to make Ollie as accessible as possible. So we do have scholarships available as well. Um, so if you're interested in joining Ollie, but you don't feel like your finances make it possible um, to do that, um, just contact the Ollie office and we're happy to work with you um, to establish um, a scholarship uh, membership for you. So um, at this point, if anyone has any questions for any of our terrific instructors, you can put them in the chat. Um, uh, or you can contact us later and someone is asking uh, whether this was recorded and if they can um, uh, view it later because they missed part of it. And yes, the, um, the open house was recorded and it will be um, sent out to everyone who registered um, tomorrow. We're also very happy to have Pittsfield Community Television with us today and they'll be um, sharing uh, the open house recording um, 
on the community TV stations they run as well as ones um, south uh, in South County and in North County as well. So uh, for Nancy asked for the science conversations class, do we need to get the New York Times for the Tuesday article? I think it's a good idea. You don't necessarily need to have the physical one, um, but you do, um, a lot of the discussion is around the uh, articles. Um, so it, uh, we do encourage you to read those articles. And a lot of times people will also send out other science uh, articles that may appear in other publications uh, for discussion as well. Um, so I don't see any other questions. Thank you, everyone. And a reminder that we have some great talks coming up before the fall semester starts. Uh, History Shock, which is by an Ali instructor on the 9th. Uh, uh, talk on cryptocurrency, the future of cryptocurrency on the 14th, and a, a fascinating talk on humor and well-being on September 17th, which we can all use. So thank you again for joining us. Thank you to our instructors, and we'll look forward to seeing you in the classroom, in person or online. Bye-bye.